Tonight's talk is Non-Fungible Tokens or NFTs, Transformative Potential and Risk Management by Dr. Andrew Park, Assistant Professor at University of Victoria at British Columbia. So this is a joint event with IEEE and SF Bay ACM. So a little bit about ACM. Our local chapter was founded in 1957, and our objective is promote knowledge of modern computing. Uh, we want to create community, support networking and hiring. We have just a $20 annual membership for our local chapter. Upcoming talks are on our meetup site. We have about uh, 11 or 12,000 members currently. We have about 200 past talks on our YouTube channel. We try to have two monthly meetings, a general computing month uh, meeting, typically on the third Wednesday of the month, and a data science seg or special interest group, typically on the fourth Monday of the month. We also work with IEEE and other societies. I'll turn it over to IEEE uh, if you want to go ahead and speak to that. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And uh, yeah, myself, Ravant. So I'm recently elected chair for IEEE Silicon Valley Blockchain Chapter. And it's a pleasure to host uh, this event along with San Francisco Bay Area SF Chapter. And also, I extend warm welcome to everyone joining tonight. So a little bit about our chapter. We started uh, Silicon Valley Blockchain Chapter in 2018, mainly focusing on blockchain technologies and uh, various application developments ranging from cryptocurrencies, smart contracts, and also uh, blockchain protocols and NFTs. And uh, we are committed to promoting blockchain technology, innovation, and also sharing knowledge through events, meetups. And also we have a reading groups. We usually work with other organizations here, professional organizations. And uh, please do follow us on our social media platform to stay updated, engage with our community. And if anyone interested, uh, we also have some other volunteering work we would welcome any if anyone interested and also if you have any suggestion for the new speakers please do let us know through our social media platform we actively engage with the outsiders and okay. uh, thank you so much uh greg you can take over what introduction okay and then for some upcoming acm events on monday december 4th after thanksgiving we have a deploying large language model chatbot using Big DL, LLM, and Llama 2 on an Intel laptop. Uh, so Big DL is a uh, Intel open source package that they'll be talking about. But it'll be exciting to see how they're, uh, what they're doing with the uh, LLM chatbot. Uh, so that's a data science SIG uh, in green talk. Then we have a SIG graph talk on Tuesday, December 5th. That's introduction to solid light holographic display technology. Uh, there's a meetup uh, link. If you want to find out more details, go ahead and take a screenshot or a picture of the pages if you want to follow up more details. And then getting into next year, Monday, January 22nd, we have large language models plus knowledge graphs is better together. It's by uh, Neo4j. And then also to bring up, it's not um, an event to uh, attend as far as uh, an audience member listening to a talk, but on March 13th and 14th, uh, we are involved in the Synopsis Science Fair. And so the SF Bay ACM has been judging and giving prizes for grades six to 12 for computing. And so we would give a first, second, third um, prize and also awards to teachers as well as the students to support STEM education. And so we're always looking for 25 or more judges to help review projects. So maybe if you want to get involved, uh, you don't have to be involved year round, but if you might be interested in looking at high school uh, projects and for their computing component. Uh, so it could be something that's uh, mainly about biology or physics, but if it has a significant computing component, that's something that we would judge. Um, so reach out to any of the ACM volunteers if you have questions. During the meeting, if you want to use chat in Zoom, you can have questions for the speaker or moderator. So we'll be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A. Then there's a call for volunteers. So tonight's talk is non-fungible tokens, uh, transformative potential and risk management. So the foundations of NFTs date back to the 1970s. They're gonna talk, we'll examine the emergence and an introduction to blockchain, the first token-based collectibles. Uh, talk about categories of the current use cases, their potential future applications. Um, talk about challenges managers face incorporating them, present an NFT adoption framework, 
offers managers strategies for evaluating the risks and benefits of NFTs. So some background for Dr. Andrew Park. Um, his research interests include information systems, innovation and technology management. He founded and sold a health tech venture based in Seattle. That's very exciting. On the academia side, he's investigating open innovation mechanisms to impact value creation of firms and personalized medicine. His publications include those in IEEE Micro. So please help me welcome uh, Dr. Andrew Park. Okay, thanks everyone. So um, I've got kind of full screen on right now and I won't necessarily be monitoring the chat. So um, I know there's some time at the end of the talk for Q&A, so if it's okay with everyone, I'll look at those at the end, unless there's some pressing questions. Um, maybe one of the uh, moderators can pause me and then we can tackle it at the time. So as Greg was mentioning, this is a brief agenda of what we'll take a look at today. So first I'll give a brief background to who I am. And I know there's sort of a range of people who have familiar familiarity with blockchain and NFTs here. So but we'll take a little bit of a step back and talk about how blockchains work and how NFTs fit into the picture uh, before we actually dive into NFTs specifically. Um, and I think one of the best ways to illustrate sort of, um, I don't know if you'd call NFTs niche at this point, but uh, sort of an emerging technology that's a subset of a broader one like blockchain, uh, rather than kind of talk about the technical aspects of it, I think what's helpful is to you know, really dive down into some case studies of actual projects um, that have built NFTs, grew them. Um, so we'll take a look at CryptoKitties. It's sort of the first mainstream NFT that hit the market. And the Board Ape Yacht, Yacht Club or Board Apes or the related NFT called CryptoPunks, um, for anyone who's following the space, they're sort of the, uh, the big ones now. I uh, will take a look at where they are and how they started. Um, and then as we were sort of alluding to, I don't know if people were listening before the talk, but uh, NFTs are in a little bit of a weird space. And they've changed a lot in the past few years. So um, that IEEE micro paper that uh, was being referenced in the previous slide, we actually wrote that paper a couple of years before it was published. The publication process for these two papers take a, take a little while. Um, so our managerial recommendations, my co-authors and I, um, we've actually changed them quite a bit um, since that paper was released. So I'll talk a little bit about where we think uh, managers should stand with respect to evaluating NFTs and where they were a few years ago. Um, did I hear? No, okay, everyone's on mute. Um, so again, we'll talk about sort of the headwinds facing NFTs right now and talk about their current state. And we'll try to prognosticate where they're gonna go moving forward. And in that, um, I got a, a private question. Um, a lot of what's happening in the regulatory space, you know, everybody knows about the FTX case in blockchain. Um, but that's sort of bleeding over into NFTs now. So we need to kind of consider the legal issues when we talk about how we think about NFTs. Okay. So on that, um, I won't belabor my personal introduction, but um, I'm currently an assistant prof of information systems at the University of Victoria. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with the term information systems, um, it's rooted in technology and computer science, uh, but that field also considers the social consequences and the business implications of new technologies. So if you sort of look at a Venn diagram, you might have you know, software engineering and computer science in one circle. Um, you might have you know, uh, business studies or management studies or um, social science and another circle and information systems sort of sits in that intersection. Um, I grew up in the Boston area. And as you see uh, on the right side of the screen, um, I'm the son of a software engineer. Um, so he taught me how to code um, in Visual Basic um, from when I was about four years old. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't consider myself a uh, you know, next level software engineer, but I do have uh, decades of experience doing this and I've never really lost my interest for coding uh, as I've grown up. Um, and you can see on those old Pentium computers, um, but you know, I, I didn't really, I was the type of kid that didn't really go out and play sports too much, but uh, I did do a lot of coding and I played a lot of video games like Wolfenstein 3D. Um, so I feel like I have an affinity towards technology in general, and hopefully I can speak somewhat knowledgeably about it as well. Um, so I've, I've been uh, involved in various startups, um, one of which uh, grew quite successfully in Seattle. And with these startups, I they were mostly in the healthcare space. So you see United Healthcare and Dana-Farber. 
Um, I had various interactions with them, both from an investment perspective, uh, from selling my company perspective, and also in the uh, blockchain space. Um, so both of these kind of big healthcare entities, um, they actually ran pilot programs uh, using blockchain to store patient records back in about 2017 and 2018. Um, and I consulted with them to talk about how uh, it sort of should be designed and how it might affect their uh, business processes. And ultimately, um, they didn't really implement any of these blockchain solutions at scale. And I think so that's sort of a theme that we're seeing in the blockchain ecosystem right now. You know, there's a ton of hype around it from a four or five years ago. People were thinking that it was going to be a transformative technology. It was going to upend every single industry. But we actually don't see very many practical applications for blockchain um, outside of cryptocurrencies, right? Um, so a lot of these kind of big entities, they evaluated blockchain and even hired people to build proofs of concept for them. Um, but we don't really see too much of it um, in, in the wild today. So we'll talk a little bit in this uh, presentation about why that might be happening. Um, I'm also kind of uh, involved in the uh, programming, uh, the blockchain community. Um, I've got a blockchain tutorial GitHub repo um, that's been uh, quite popular uh, over the years. And it's basically how to build your blockchain from scratch. And, you know, I look, kind of teach people who are interested, you know, how proof of stake works, how proof, uh, proof of work works, uh, basic networking, and so on. So um, everything from, you know, how Bitcoin determines difficulty levels in its hashing, uh, all of these kind of little micro lessons uh, I provide in this GitHub repo. So if anybody is interested in checking that out, I've included a screenshot here. So as I mentioned, we'll take a bit of a step back for people who might not be you know, fully immersed in the blockchain environment. And I'll give you know, just a couple minutes a very simplified example of how blockchain works. So the philosophical idea behind blockchain is that we can disintermediate the money system, right? So um, right now, how uh, let's say I wanted to send you know, 100 bucks via Venmo or you know, Zelle or something like that to Raven. Right. Um, there's there's actually no way for me to send it electronically directly to them. Uh, essentially, I have to you know create an order through my bank. Um, there's some intermediary that uh, takes that bank order. Um, they we need to wait for them to process the order, and then the intermediary deposits it in Revan's bank account. Um, basically, and we're at the we're basically beholden to when they want to do it and if they even want to approve that transaction. Right. Um, so the, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto, if you read his paper, the philosophical impetus for creating this uh, was to get rid of these intermediaries. So the network itself uh, would determine when, when people get paid and the network itself would be responsible for securing everybody's money. So it's a decentralized protocol. It's a decentralized philosophy. And the idea is that no single entity should be able to control our money supply and how money gets transferred. So... If we think about, you've probably heard of the term, you know, a distributed ledger before, right? And how distributed ledger works, which underpins blockchain, is if we take a look at this diagram here, let's say there's three people and they each have, you know, one dollar or one unit of currency. Um, this ledger keeps track of how much currency or how many tokens or how many dollars each person has. So let's say Bob, Alice, and Jane, they each have one dollar. And on Saturday, they have a dollar. On Sunday, they have a dollar. They're not transacting with each other, right? But let's say on Wednesday, Bob and Jane each pay Alice $1. Then a new block or a new row needs to get added to this ledger that says on Wednesday, Bob now has $0. Jane has $0 because they both gave their $1 to Alice. So Alice should have $3, right? But how can we make this happen and make sure fraud doesn't happen. So we make sure, you know, Bob doesn't edit the balance and ed edit the ledger. And how do we make this all legit um, at the same time, not have the central, uh, uh, central entity that governs this whole process. And that's where blockchain comes into, into play. And the short answer to how the whole network secures this and make sure that no single entity uh, is involved in this is each of these three people, Bob, Alice, and Jane, they use their computers to try to solve a really hard math problem, right? So those who are familiar with hashing and encryption, they know I'm simplifying this quite a bit, um, but you can think of all of these computers, they're in a race to solve this really hard math problem. And whosoever computer solves it first, they get the privilege of adding that row or that block to that 
big ledger, right? So in this example, let's say Jane wins and she gets the privilege of adding that ledger to that block. And her reward is there's a pool of money that gets uh, that's given to people who win this really hard math problem. So as her reward, she gets a little bit of money uh, for the time and the electricity that her computer used to solve this really hard math problem. So now the ledger looks like this, right? Um, so we know that there was a transaction on Wednesday where both Bob and Jane added $1 to Alice's account. And of course they should lose $1 because they gave it to her. Um, but on top of that, Jane gets another extra dollar because she solved, her computer solved that hard math problem. So she got it from this pool that's reserved uh, to incentivize these three people in this network to solve this hard math problem with their computers. Now, the obvious question here is, well, Jane has the privilege to add, uh, to update the ledger with the new balances. What if she goes rogue, right? What if she um, doesn't like Bob and Alice or she wants to cheat Bob and Alice and Jane and Bob each gave a dollar to Alice. So Alice's balance should be three, Bob and Jane should be zero, but the block that Jane adds, she gives all the money to herself. So the false block that she tries to add to this ledger Bob has zero, Alice has zero, and Jane has three. So how does the network protect against that? And the answer is uh, Bob and Alice each have a copy of the ledger as well. Everybody has a copy of the ledger and they know that the new block that's being added isn't consistent with, with what they expect to see on their ledger. So they vote against Jane and say, no, you can't add that block to the ledger. And Jane's now lost out because she hasn't gotten her reward and she's basically wasted all her time and her electricity for nothing. So again, I'll just emphasize how that works. So if Jane tries to add a false block to the ledger, then Bob and Alice, since they also have a copy of the ledger and know what the state of the ledger should be, they automatically vote out Jane's ledger and the integrity of the ledger is preserved. So you can imagine it's instead of these three people, let's say there were you know, thousands and thousands of people around the world, uh, all with a copy of this ledger, you know, all, not all, but a, a small percentage of them, they're using their computing resources to, tr to try and solve these hard math problems. Uh, the network gets pretty secure, right? Because it's very decentralized. There's been lots and lots of people who know what the ledger should, should look like. Um, and that's how the whole system can operate without a single entity governing, governing it, without a single entity governing each transaction. Um, and uh, that's how essentially Bitcoin works. Um, there's some kind of complexities to this. So for example, the other popular blockchain is one called Ethereum. Um, they don't use uh, a hard math problem um, to determine who gets to add the block. They use another protocol called proof of stake. Um, but you know that's sort of beyond the technical scope of what I wanted to touch on today. But you can kind of think most blockchains, they started off this way. And this kind of solving a hard math problem, you've heard of this term probably is called proof of work. And this is how Bitcoin still operates today. Now we sort of start talking about the, uh, the information systems part and move away from the software engineering, right? So uh, what are the business applications of blockchain other than just cryptocurrencies and having a new type of money um, that's disintermediated? Right. Um, some of the pros of blockchain in general is that, you know, we can now remove government from controlling our money uh, for the libertarians in the audience and the ones that uh, aren't too enthralled with the state of inflation. Um, you can kind of see that they can the the, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve can make unilateral decisions on how much money it prints um, with Bitcoin. There is a set rate of new money that gets uh, entered into the pool and no single person can alter that. Um, so governments are sort of removed from the control of money and you don't have to just uh, create new tokens or create new types of currencies using blockchain. Um, in theory, there's lots of other things that can benefit from the security and decentralization of a blockchain. Um, and one example is uh, medical records. So this has been explored at length, as I mentioned, you know, a company like United Healthcare has explored this at length. Um, but what if we had a system where instead of every time we go to a new family doctor or we switch insurance companies, uh, we didn't have to call our existing family doctor and ask them to fax over our medical history, right? Which in parts of North America, actually most of the US, that's still happening quite a bit. Um, and also with supply chain management, right? 
Um, let's say there we're getting a big shipment of blueberries from South America, and we want to have a really strong chain of custody, and we want to know exactly where it's been, if it's ever been tampered with. Um, instead of having all of this sitting in a Postgres database, all of that information uh, in a centralized database, um, what if it was stored in a decentralized uh, record keeping system like a blockchain, uh, so nobody can mess with it, um, and there's it, it actually sits, there's posterity, so anybody can audit it and see where those blueberries have ended up in the supply chain, right? Um, and this is where NFTs come into play, right? Um, so NFTs are um, related to cryptocurrencies, but they are they they are essentially kind of you can think of if you have you know 100 bitcoin each bitcoin is exactly the same or if you have 100 us dollars right if you have 100 one dollar bills um notwithstanding the fact that they were printed at different times but they so they might have different images on them but one of those one dollar bills is equivalent to another one of those one dollar bills right but in uh, with nfts you can actually create tokens where each of those dollar bills have unique characteristics. So let's say, for example, one of those $1 bills was hot pink and another one of those $1 bills was dull gray, right? And there was a group of people who really liked pink colored money. They might value that hot pink $1 bill uh, more than the dull gray one, right? So you have this concept of non-fungible tokens, meaning uh, they're tokens just like currencies are, but uh, each of them aren't equivalent. They each have a unique characteristic. And that's what we'll explore more in this talk. And one of the more um, kind of applications of blockchain that I was more excited about um, was when they actually started talking about, you know, how can we sort of democratize uh, land registries in developing countries, right? So, for example, in Honduras, if anyone's familiar with it, there's a lot of corruption uh, with parcels of land. So you might own a parcel of land and your family's had it for generations and generations. But the central registry might be quite corrupt, and somebody might show up and uh, with a big bag full of cash and say, "Nope, that plot of land over there uh, is actually mine, and it doesn't. It's not owned by that family um, that's had it for generations and generations." So there's a lot of excitement around converting land registries into a blockchain system, where it's fully auditable and you know it's secured by a blockchain, so people can't come in and alter it. And uh, unfortunately, it's not happening yet. Um, but I know that this is one of the applications that you know people, governments around the world are still looking into and still excited about. Um, and that's one of the nice things about blockchain that hopefully might come to fruition someday. And of course, with any new technology, um, I can't remember which uh, technologist said this, but um, any new technology, it's not good or bad. Um, it's always both. And it's never neutral, right? Um, any transformative technology that is. So with blockchain, it's the exact same thing. There's It's a two-sided coin, right? Um, so governments not being able to control our money isn't necessarily a panacea. It's not always a good thing all the time. Of course, there's the potential for tax avoidance. Um, the US government and governments around the world have become quite competent at uh, analyzing uh, analyzing blockchains. And you know, a lot of these kind of regulators will just go into Etherscan and look at transaction records and they actually get they've actually gotten pretty good at trying to nail down who owns what wallets right but it's still a very difficult task right compared to just calling up a bank and saying you know how much money does this person have because they owe us this many uh, this much in taxes right um and there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty as well you know how do we protect against scams right um you know if i don't know how it is in the uh i've been out of the us for a few years now but just recently when you go to any canadian bank um, I think it's a protective measure, but the teller will ask you um, if you want to, if you're trying to withdraw withdraw cash, the teller will ask you, um, you know, are you aware that there's a lot of scams asking for cash in exchange for Bitcoin? Um, if you're not, if anybody's asked you for Bitcoin with this cash, um, we have these webinars that you can join so you can protect yourself from these types of scams, right? Um, so there's a lot of that happening right now. And of course, there is the issue with, you know, facilitating criminal activity, especially when Bitcoin first came out. This was a big concern. Um, if any of you peruse the dark web using your Tor browser, uh, you know, there's all sorts of services that you can buy in the dark web. And almost exclusively, they all ask for payment in cryptocurrency. Right? Um, so there's a lot of kind of moral turpitude there that I would hope that most of us aren't too thrilled about. Um, and then we probably know about these giant investor losses as well, right? So part of the reason that I actually got disillusioned with 
uh, the private sector and blockchain in the 2017, 2018 era was just every single, um, uh, every single blockchain project immediately got this reputation of, you know, potentially being a scam, right? So anybody who was involved in a blockchain project, the first thing they had to do is try to convince investors that, you know, they weren't running a shady operation. And unfortunately, a lot of these, you know, ICOs that were happening at the time uh, were quite shady, right? So um, a lot of people lost a lot of money, um, a lot of money disappeared. And so that's one of the drawbacks of the proliferation of blockchain, right? Um, and we've got these kind of persistent issues with blockchain that we can't, for some reason, really get, uh, we, we can't really seem to um, overcome some of these hurdles. So uh, people always talk about scaling as a problem. And of course, there's some nice layer two solutions right now, but you know, people still aren't really using you know, Bitcoin to go pay for their coffee, right? Um, and in theory, you should be able to do that with these layer two solutions, but you know, whether it's a networking issue where there's not enough people doing it, um, we still haven't been able to overcome sort of the social hurdles and even the technical ones. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with this space, again, some of these layer two solutions, uh, they have their huge drawbacks as well. And some, sometimes you're better off just paying the transaction fees and sticking to layer one, right? So we're kind of wrought with some of these technical issues that haven't been solved. So NFTs, let's kind of talk more specifically about non-fungible tokens, right? So if you've heard of a project like Board Ape Yacht Club, um, a big kind of news item was that Beeple, he's a you know, traditional artist. He sold an art piece for $69 million a couple of years ago. And um, if, you, if you look at it, it's a pretty cool art piece, right? But just the fact that NFTs were so heavily hyped at the time, um, I, I think uh, some of these kind of traditional uh, art pieces that were thousands of years old, um, they're not fetching, fetching $69 million at auction houses like Christie, Christie's, right? So um, there's a lot of hype that surrounded NFTs and um, kind of talk, going back to the, 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 the blockchain connection here, um, as I was mentioning, I'll emphasize this again, the idea of NFTs is that, let's say instead of $101 bills, um, you have each of these $1 bills, but they each have different unique characteristics that have different value, uh, value to people, right? So let's say, again, one of those $1 bills was hot pink and somebody really likes hot pink $1 bills, they might actually pay $10 for that $1 bill because they really want a hot pink $1 bill. Um, but if it's just your typical green, grayish $1 bill, uh, people might only pay $1 for it, right? So the idea of NFTs, again, is that you have uh, tokens on the blockchain and they all have unique characteristics. So there's not a one-to-one -one, uh, replaceable function between those two, right? Um, this seems like a nice little summary slide of the difference between NFTs and traditional cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Um, I would probably say I agree with most of these, right? They're unique. Cryptocurrencies, all the different tokens are uniform. Um, the NFTs, they're not interchangeable. You can't just straight up trade a gray $1 bill for a hot pink $1 bill because they're worth different amounts to different people. Uh, whereas with Bitcoin, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin to everybody. Everybody knows exactly what it's worth and it's worth the same to everyone. Um, this is this third point I would probably disagree with. Um, they say that they're difficult to sell because they're generally illiquid. And with cryptocurrencies, they're traded on marketplaces. Um, so th there's now very popular marketplaces like NF for NFTs as well. So if you look at a place like OpenSea or you know, looks rare or rareable, um, you can offload your NFTs pretty quickly um, as long as you know find someone who's willing to pay the right price for it. Right? And generally, they're not divisible as well in, in NFTs. So you can you know you can transact with 0. 0.0001 Bitcoin, uh, whereas you can't have 0. 0.0001 of a hot pink one dollar bill. Right? So. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think maybe talking rather than sort of talking about the history of the you know the technical aspects of NF NFTs and diving too much more into the differences between NFTs and cryptocurrencies, um, I think it's much more interesting and illustrative just to look at a couple high-profile projects um, that were NFTs and see how they got big and the, some of the challenges that they're facing. Um, cryptocurrency, cri crypto kitties is probably. And I think most people would agree it's the first mainstream NFT. Um, it's the first kind of uh, non-fungible token that really got people excited about the potential for NFTs. 
Um, and I have special insight into this particular project. Um, they happen to be created by a company called Axiom Zen, uh, based in the Vancouver area. And I was living there at the time when uh, they released CryptoKitties. Right? So um, you know, I uh, got to know the some of the team members quite well, uh, understood what their motivations are. And the, the it, it really sort of turned the whole industry on its head and really showed everyone that blockchain could be something other than just Bitcoin, right? Um, they became, these cryptocurrencies, what they are, are they're uh, individual tokens that are associated with a picture of a digital cat, right? So this would be one token, this green guy here, this yellow token, the, the token here would be a yellow cat. And they became very popular collectibles and trading items. So someone who owned this green cat, you know, might be very proud that they own this green cat. And they, they might say, you know, I'll trade my, you my green cat. Um, but I want your yellow cat and your gray cat. And so many people started buying these crypto kitties and transacting on them that it actually nearly uh, brought the entire Ethereum blockchain network to a halt in late 2017. That's how popular uh, crypto kitties were. Just this one application, this one game uh, nearly brought down the entire blockchain network, right? And part of the reason they were so successful is uh, first of all, they did their traditional social media marketing uh, they marketed heavily the fact that, you know, we're releasing a new blockchain project. It's not just some, um, you know, it's not just some ICO. It's not an, it's not a cryptocurrency. It's an actual playable game, right? And people got quite excited about that because it was really one of the first ones that did that. Um, and they su successfully gamified it. So if any of you have played with CryptoKitties, the kind of novel part of CryptoKitties is that you can actually breed cats as well. So if you own a green cat and a yellow cat, uh, you could combine them and generate a third cat, for example, that might have horns, but with yellow fur, um, that was uh, the offspring of these cats. So there was a kind of game component to this that was quite fun to people um, in that you could actually trade cats, you could breed them, uh, you could make a litter of cats and then trade those. Um, so this was, this was quite novel at the time, right? Um, another really interesting thing they did, uh, Axiom Zen, the company, is they actually sought regulatory approval before they actually released the project. So um, as I was mentioning before, there were a lot of issues in the ICO space, the initial coin offering space. Um, an initial coin offering you can think of as, you know, an IPO, but for cryptocurrencies. If I want to create a new cryptocurrency, um, I might hype that up, ask people to send me Bitcoin, and I tell them that once my project is released, I'll send you, you know, X number of this new cryptocurrency, right? So there was a lot of regulatory scrutiny, um, not just in the US and Canada, but all around the world. So uh, securities regulators didn't really know what to do with these things. There's uh, there's no security. Um, there were very few security guidelines. There were very few rules that companies could follow uh, to make sure that they stay compliant with local securities laws. Um, so CryptoKitties or Axiom Zen, they actually started working with um, the, a preeminent law firm in the Vancouver area and the local securities commission um, in the Vancouver area as well. And they say, hey, you know, we're about to release this project, right? We're not here to scam investors. Our uh, crypto kitty, it's not a crypto, traditional cryptocurrency. So you shouldn't regulate it in that way. Um, each of these tokens that we're producing, they're unique. So this is more of a game than it is a, a typical cryptocurrency project. So um, I don't know the inner workings of what the securities regulator de uh, determined uh, with respect to the legality of CryptoKitties, but uh, they kept the Axiom Zen kept the local regulators abreast of everything they wanted to do, and generally got the blessing to release CryptoKitties to the public without any fear of reprisal or without any you know punitive measures being um, you know handed down on them. Whereas with other ICOs and other cryptocurrencies, there were lots of headlines coming out. You know, a new cryptocurrency comes out and the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission comes in and finds them a huge amount or, you know, the founders, you know, they, or worse, the founders go to jail, right? Um, and this is just something that Axiom Zen was very strategic about and say, you know, rather than try to avoid regulatory scrutiny, why don't we work with the reg uh, local regulators and make sure that how we're releasing this project is consistent with what with, with, uh, what they want to see as well. So CryptoKitties was initially very popular and very successful uh, for some of those reasons. But unfortunately, within a year, the project was nearly defunct. Um, there was basically no more transaction act activity happening at any appreciable scale. 
Um, people who are holding on to these crypto kitties, hoping that they would appreciate, they basically were worth pennies on the dollar. And there are a few different reasons for this decline. Uh, one was just the popularity of the Ethereum blockchain network and the transaction fees got quite high. And so if I wanted to send a crypto kitty to you know, my friend or I wanted to sell my crypto kitty, a lot of the time the transaction fees were just as expensive as what I was making them. So people just sort of lost interest in transacting. And there was kind of poor supply and demand management. The economics of the project were quite uh, faulty. Um, it was deeply flawed, in fact. Um, what the founders thought was cool with respect to gamification and being able to breed new cats, uh, the huge downside is that when you introduce new cats to the supply, it means all the existing cats, they become, they're, they're worthless, right? So as more and more people started playing this game and breeding these cats, the the, the, the collective value or the individual value of the, uh, the, the cats that people were holding, um, they started to decline dramatically, right? So people got less excited about the project because of, uh, because of that. And finally, in, in the long term, it really wasn't a fun game to play, right? It was fun. It was kind of novel at the time. We'd never seen it. Yeah, it's kind of fun to breed two cats and see a third cat that sort of shares similar characteristics. But these are all static images. And after you breed a few cats a few times, it doesn't become that much fun anymore. And you sort of lose interest that way, right? So if you kind of compare um, a simple game like Crypto Kitties to a legendary game like StarCraft, right? Um, there's a reason StarCraft, even though it's not as popular now, it still has a very loyal following and there's still tournaments for it uh, because it's just so much fun to play, right? It's so strategic. Uh, there's so many different things you can do with it. Um, whereas with CryptoKitties, yes, it is a game, but the novelty wears off very quickly, right? So Axiom Zen, um, they've, they suffered a lot. This was sort of their kind of one hit wonder and they've learned some of these lessons and now they're trying to pivot. They're still around. Um, but now they're trying to pivot to creating NFTs that have more utility, that are more fun to use, right? Uh, so they've rebranded themselves to Dapper Labs, and they've partnered with some of these uh, sports uh, conglomerates uh, to offer unique NFTs that have, you know, hopefully more utility, right? So they have an NFT collection called UFC Strike that each where each token is associated with a video of highlights of their favorite fighters. So it's kind of like trading cards, right? If I own, um, if I own a, a UFC strike NFT of, um, say, George St. Pierre, right, and my friend owns one of John Jones, then, you know, I could trade them and I could show each other how cool these things are. Um, none of these applications, as far as I can tell, have taken off, but you can see they've learned their lesson and they're trying to build NFTs that have more utility. Okay, so next one um, is much more of a topical or contemporary example called the Board Ape Yacht Club. Um, this was created by uh, Yuga Labs out of Miami and they became incredibly popular and they're still popular to this day. But just like CryptoKitties, the idea is you have the set of tokens um, and each of these tokens is associated with a funny image of an ape, right? These are all different apes that you can buy. Um, and each of the, the collection as a whole is called the Board Ape Yacht, Yacht Club. Um, this company, Yuga Labs, also bought another cl collection called CryptoPunks. So if you've heard of the collection called CryptoPunks, um, they're under the same company now. Um, so they had massive success, even more success than CryptoKitties. At one point, they had $350 million in monthly sales at their peak um, based on the trading volume of each of these uh, board, ape, uh, board Apes in their collection. Um, so this is different from CryptoKitties in that these are static images and they're not a game, but they did have some utility and Yuga Labs was kind of clever about the way they approached this. So um, they're not, they aren't static images, but if you owned one of these apes or if you owned a certain type of ape, it would grant you privileges to various parties that Yuga Labs would have, these exclusive parties. So if you were, if, if one example is they had a big yacht party in New York. And if you had a certain type of board ape and you showed it at the door, you proved that you owned it, you were allowed uh, onto this yacht to party, right? And they also, their marketing angle was to align themselves with celebrities, right? So um, they got, they partnered with all of these people here. You see Post Malone, Steph Curry, and they all endorsed Board, board Ape Yacht Club, or you know, they publicly declared that they owned a Board Ape. And that drove a lot of hype and got a lot of eyeballs onto the project, right? But really, uh, their, their key here is they were able to generate exclusivity. So if you owned a board ape, you know, you're proud of owning a board ape because you could it, it meant that you had a certain social status, 
Um, you know, if Steph Curry uh, owns an ape and I haven't, I, I own an ape, you know, that must mean something. You know, it lets me go to all these fancy parties that Yuga Labs holds. Um, so that was sort of their marketing strategy to get a whole bunch of eyeballs onto the project. And a lot of these apes actually started selling for a lot. So some of these were selling for about $250,000 uh, per ape. But the bad news is just like uh, CryptoKitties, they had a huge decline in popularity as well. Um, and again, it happened very quickly as well. If you look at the trading volume today, it's probably less than 10% of the early 2022 uh, peak. Um, and there are very similar reasons for decline with um, CryptoKitties. Really, there's no utility. I mean, it, sure, it lets you get into a bunch of parties you know, in the New York area if you own a board ape, but that sort of wears off for a while. You can go to exclusive parties in New York and just pay regular money too if you want, right? Why do I need to go to the trouble of creating a wallet and finding an ape on OpenSea? And you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a laborious process, right? Um, and then beyond that, there was no utility. It wasn't a game. There's nothing you could do with these things, right? Um, and then there's a lot of legit legitimacy concerns. There were concerns and accusations that you know insiders were just trading apes between themselves uh, to you know rocket up the price to make these board apes seem like they were worth more uh, than they were. Um, and now, uh, unlike CryptoKitties, they're under serious regulatory scrutiny. Um, a few months ago, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission um, they usually left NFTs alone up to this point. Uh, but they realized that there are a lot of scams happening in the NFT space as well. And the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission declared that they would be investigating the Board Ape Yacht Club. Um, and this was the big, first big enforcement announcement against the top NFT project. So this was a really big deal. Um, so there's speculation now that the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission will start you know, um, kind of laying down the hammer on some of these NFT projects, just like they have been for cryptocurrencies. So a lot of issues surrounding NFTs right now. And that actually has affected how we uh, recommend to managers or prospective managers who want to integrate NFTs into their companies, right? Um, so uh, when Greg was uh, giving the nice introduction, um, he referenced an IEEE paper, uh, which was uh, published you know, a year or two ago, but we actually started writing it in 2020. And the NFT environment was very different at that point. Um, NFTs were hyped. They were viewed as sort of the non-shady version of cryptocurrencies. And a lot of the, uh, the a lot of the kind of ecosystem looked at NFTs very favorably as sort of a nice breath of fresh air. And at that time, there were all sorts of different uh, applications that were being envisioned for NFTs. So uh, I talked about that land title management one in Honduras. Um, I talked about supply chain management. Uh, people were saying that you know, we could even represent a physical car with an NFT and the NFT would have the license plate or the VIN number of the car on it. And instead of us having to, you know, ship my, if I, I wouldn't have to ship my car from Victoria to, uh, to San Francisco uh, to Revent for him to take a look at it before buying it, um, I could just send the NFT and then we could deal with the shipping later. And then if Revent has the NFT of that car, um, then, you know, he, he owns that car and then the shipping details, maybe we can ship it when shipping costs are lower later, right? Um, and then even things like replacing how we do mortgages, right? Why do we need a mortgage company um, to intermediate all our lending? Uh, why don't we just have the uh, blockchain uh, deal with that for us, right? Um, so we had some managerial recommendations saying, you know, based on how complex it is and how many different parties need to be involved and how novel your idea is, um, what sort of uh, strategy you should take to incorporate NFTs. But I won't change, spend that much more time on this slide because just given the headwinds and the decline of NF NFT popularity, our recommendations actually changed very quickly. Um, within probably 18 months, we realized those recommendations were outdated because a lot of these different um, applications, envisioned applications, uh, we were pretty confident weren't ever weren't going to happen in the near future, right? Hopefully they'll happen someday. Um, so in the near future, this is another paper that we released. How do we deal with NFTs? So we kind of found three buckets that we thought managers need to focus on. So first, we um, once we started writing this paper, there were you know blockchains just popping up left and right, right? Derivatives of blockchain like Polygon, um, you know, blockchains on their own that were unrelated to Ethereum. So we were thinking that there needed to be some technological 
interoperative interoperability between all these new blockchains and systems that were popping up. But on top of that, there needed to be organizational interoperability. So if a manager um, decides that you know he or she can reach a big enough audience because they've sort of uh, amalgamated all the different blockchains that were around, um, they now need to say convince their existing organization to adopt NFTs. So for example, you know my software development team might be very excited about creating some non-fungible tokens, but you know my regulatory team or my marketing team might say, you know what is this? Right? I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to spend any time. This is a waste of time. And there's a big education effort to make sure the entire organization is on board uh, with pursuing NFTs. And then on top of that, you have your regulatory piece. It was very evident to us that uh, companies could get a huge competitive advantage if they could get regulatory blessing from their local securities and exchange commissions. Um, so we thought that these kind of three big interoperability pieces are what managers need to take care of before they see success with NFTs. And as we were writing this paper, uh, NFTs got you know, even more and more, for, they went even further down the hype cycle, right? Even more reports of scams, even kind of less interest declining sales. So we changed our recommendations. I, would, I should say evolved, right? When I say change, uh, I think that implies that we were completely wrong, but you know, I think even if we were wrong, I think the right approach is to update our recommendations accordingly. So now this is a paper we're working on currently uh, where we've sort of changed the key considerations that we think man managers need to have if they want to consider uh, implementing NFTs into their organizations, right? So first, you need to prioritize utility. So I think that's a lesson we learned from CryptoKitties and Board Ape Yacht Club. Uh, it needs, if you're going to create an NFT game, it needs to be a fun game to play that people are going to play for a long time. And that might even be more important than the fact that it's an NFT. Um, you should focus on really having a fun game. And if NFTs enable that, they should be a consequence of the decision to make a fun game. And the basis of your game shouldn't be NFTs for the sake of NFTs, right? Um, and then second is this regulatory issue. And in the US, if you talk to kind of any sort of blockchain founder, um, they'll usually agree that the regulatory environment is a huge issue. Uh, in fact, the uh, kind of lingo that's being used now is that the U.S. Uh, regulates blockchain uh, by enforcement, right? Meaning that they don't have these clear guidelines that blockchain companies can follow uh, to make sure they're staying on board. Uh, rather, the guidelines are being sort of made on a whim when the U.S. Securities Commission, uh, SEC, decides that they don't like a project and they come in after the project is launched and they enforce some type of punitive measure on them, right? And then almost the last consideration is trying to get early and broad user transact uh, traction, right? So whether it's through social media or generating exclusivity, um, that's almost the tip of the pyramid now. Um, and you need to focus on these two things. So let's talk a little bit more in the time that we have left about why there's no killer NFT app. You know, why after several years and after all this promise around NFTs, you know, why are we only stuck with these collectibles like Board Ape Yacht Club? And why don't we have you know, NFT mortgages, right? Um, and I think a nice reference here is the South Park episode with the underpants gnomes. And the idea behind this episode, if you haven't seen it, is that there's these kind of mystical gnomes that go around and in the middle of the night, they steal kids' underpants, right? And Cartman and his friends, uh, they actually catch these gnomes stealing their underpants and they follow them to this cave and they find that these gnomes have collected this giant mound of underpants from all the kids around South Park, right? And the South Park kids, they ask, you know, what are you going to do with all these underpants, right? And the gnomes, they say, well, collecting underpants is just phase one. And the South Park kids say, what's phase two? And the gnomes, they look at them blankly and they say, well, phase three is profit, right? And it is kind of funny and kind of absurd if you think about this episode, but this is actually how a lot of blockchain companies work nowadays. Um, there's There was so much hype around blockchain. They were just saying, let's just create an NFT. Um, let's just create a new cryptocurrency. Let's have an ICO and the money will take care of itself, right? But it had really no functional value in the middle, no utility um, that really let that company stick around for the long term, right? So we're still in a phase where I think, you know, we haven't really figured out phase two yet for NFTs. And that's part of the reason that we don't see an NFT killer app. And here are some of the other challenges that are facing NFTs today, right? Um, people really still, for the most part, 
um, buy NFTs because they want the asset to appreciate and they want to sell it later for a higher price, right? And that really only gets you so far. And that's why we have lots of NFT collectibles nowadays, but really nothing else, right? Um, and there's all these technical issues with high transaction costs and scaling challenges, right? And of course, there's layer two, like Lightning. And as I mentioned before, uh, layer twos, they have their own issues as well. And, you know, going back to the Bitcoin example, you see very few people still, you know, paying for a coffee with Bitcoin. And if they do, it's just a kind of an act of novelty, right? Um, there's high barriers to entry, right? If you ask, for example, you know, uh, my elderly mother to set up a wallet and, you know, go get an NFT on OpenSea, like it's, it's not, a, it's a near impossible task, right? Um, and the need for blockchain really hasn't been demonstrated for broad, broad applications. So there used to be all these kind of management papers in business where the big flow diagram is saying, do I need a blockchain in my organization or can I just, you know, keep using Postgres and achieve the exact same thing? And there were all these webs kind of helping you make that decision. And now sort of tongue in cheek, this is the latest managerial recommendation. Do I need blockchain? No, right? And a lot of the reason why is because we just haven't seen applications that have been truly successful. Right. So we'll spend a little bit of time on this slide and um, looking to the future, right? Where do we think NFTs are headed? And what are some of you know, my observations or recommendations of what I think needs to happen if we're able to truly realize uh, the potential for NFTs and see some of these transformative applications, right? Um, and the things that sort of buttress the things that I think we need to do are these two sentiments here, right? Um, there's a lot of kind of experienced developers in the room, but you know, if you were to start try to build a Web3 app from scratch that's fully decentralized, that's a game. I mean, just me being 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 a software engineer myself, I, I did, like it's just it, it's a completely daunting task to me, right? So I'd have to learn some solidity probably and. And I have some smart contracts that follow the rules of the game. Um, I have to, I have to be able to understand. Um, you know, I have, you know, I have to have some artwork. I have to be able to understand the networking. I have to understand how the latency in my game is actually going to affect the transactions. If there's any transactions on the base uh, base layer blockchain, how is that going to affect what happens in the game? Um, you know, I'm not a big graphics guy. Uh, how does my server need to interact? Like you can kind of see like the list of things that need to be taken care of. Um, it's inordinately complex, right? And then for general consumers, you know, how do they get started with blockchain, right? So for all of us, it's pretty simple to set up a MetaMask wallet and you know go on to KuCoin or Binance or something and get some cryptocurrencies. But for most people, it's it's a big technical hurdle, right? Um, and blockchain development nowadays just requires too much busy work. I think when Solidity first came out, a lot of people were excited to learn about it. Um, but if you were to, using a specific example, let's say I wanted to build a Web3 app and I wanted to build a decentralized Facebook marketplace, right? I need to be able to connect these primitives somehow, right? I need to be able to connect payments, you know, off voting state, right? So if you've heard of the term a decentralized autonomous organization, um, if Facebook marketplace is going to be truly decentralized, you know, how can I govern that whole system? Um, I need to deal with file storage. A big criticism of NFTs is that you know, uh, the tokens might be on the blockchain, but all these pictures of board apes and crypto kitties, um, they're actually being stored on physical servers somewhere, right? Um, there's some exceptions. There's, you know, I, uh, no, I, the kind of interplanetary file system, if you've heard of that, IPFS. Um, there's some exceptions to that, but for the most part, if you buy a board ape, the picture of the image is sitting on a static server somewhere, right? So if, do I need to decentralize that as well? And it's really hard to convince developers to, do all this, all of this glue work, right? Um, and you know, people need to learn about how all of these things work, and they need to learn how to make it decentralized. So it's a there's a big technical challenge if we want to truly see, you know, NFTs flourish in a Web three ecosystem, right? Um, and if you actually look at, you know, not being so cynical, but if we look at how we might solve this, um, I think it's nice to look at the history of computer science and how operating systems developed. If we're trying to build a Web3 app based on NFTs, and we're trying to connect all these primitives. You now, what connects primitives for us, right? It's an operating system. So if you look at Mac OS, they unify hardware, networking, identity, file storage. There is a precedent here. And um, yeah, Greg? Yeah. Um, one of the people has a question. Okay. Say, NFT is no utility, 
we mean in the same sense as monopoly money versus US dollars or something more subtle, like software without a hardware architecture on which to execute it? Yeah, I would say it's um, when I say it lacks utility, I'm more talking about it lacking utility in a very abstract social sense. So an NFT, if you're going to build an NFT game, the utility of it is that it really needs to be really fun, right? Um, the reason that, for example, people play World of Warcraft is, isn't because they love the software architecture behind World of Warcraft. They play it because it's so much fun, right? So um, when I say that NFTs uh, currently don't have utility is that um, it doesn't really have social or human utility in the applications that have come out yet. So that's that's how I'm referring to it. Okay. Um, yeah. A question from me. Mm -hmm. I work in generative AI for much of the year. And yeah. so one of the concerns about in the past is fake news, fake identities, where you can generate a fake person. And so I uh, don't know the space very well of the blockchain and NFTs. Is there something in there that can certify I'm candidate X and I certify this message or I endorse this message. Is there some way that endorsements from uh, major figures now that would be used in, you know, marketing or mass communications where you don't have just one um, kitty of a certain shape, but you, you know, some way of endorsing like uh, all of uh, candidate X has a certain endorsement that's trackable and verifiable. The idea is if enough good actors verify their identity, then the remaining thing that's not verified by a bad actor, then just by not being verified, it would be suspicious. Yeah, um, it's a good question. And actually, the application that you uh, bring up specifically, uh, voting on the blockchain as one that's been explored a lot. Um, and if the entire, if all of society agreed that, um, for example, that we would consume our marketing messages on applications that were built on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, what you're describing might actually work because you would have to sign cryptographically a marketing message, put it on the blockchain, and then somebody else would actually consume it by reading, reading it off the blockchain. Um, the problem right now is society as a, as a whole hasn't agreed that we would only look at Greg's cryptographically signed uh, message and only consume that and take that as truth, right? So um, even if you had a blockchain-based identity, um, I could still you know, say I'm Greg and you know, post all these messages that you wouldn't agree with on Facebook, Twitter, and so on and so on. And they might, uh, well, people might- Easier still than getting the whole population to agree might be news corporations that do fact checking. You yeah. know, maybe if it's something that the fact checkers could check and they consume their marketing when they're doing fact checking to verify. Yeah. You know, that would be a tenth of a percent of the population or much, okay. much smaller as opposed to 100% of the population. That might be, you know, I'm just looking for what would be more doable. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what you're describing is actually um, being explored in the centralized domain. So if you, if anybody uses community notes on Twitter, um, that's actually one way that fact checking has, you know, the architecture on fact checking is change, starting to change. So they're they're using machine learning models there um, to see, you know, if somebody puts out something contentious, uh, they tweet something contentious. Um, somebody has to say there's something wrong with this, and then another person who hasn't usually had a different opinion with that person has to agree that there was something wrong with it. And then there's a community note that shows up under that tweet saying, you know, this tweet is wrong for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, so with 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 blockchain, I don't. So this is so what you're sort of describing on Twitter is exploring it. Um, blockchain still has the fundamental problem that it doesn't have the audience um, that say uh, Twitter currently has. Um, but you know, to to your point, hopefully we can kind of marry uh, a, a functionality like Twitter has uh, with something on the blockchain, and then there might be more utility that we see out of NFTs. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, good questions, and if we uh, look at Kind of going back to this slide, you know, from how do, if we overcome some, how do we overcome some of these technical limitations, right? Um, so if we want to make developing Web three easier, um, operating systems unify these primitives, and they're really difficult to do. And we suspect that the same thing needs to happen with Web three. There needs to be, you know, not just people kind of randomly gluing uh, decentralized, you know, you know, not gluing payments and DAOs and identity and auth all of that together but kind of like a single unified operating system for Web3 
uh, that can actually unify these primitives for us to make building Web3 apps just a lot more enjoyable um, for software developers. Right? And then that might get more software developers thinking of creative applications for it. And we might actually see NFTs and Web3 start to flourish out of that. Um, and if we look at this kind of social arrangements that might need to happen around that, um, I've had a lot of discussions with you know, both uh, social scientists and technologists around this. The reason that it's hard to make a Web3 OS is you really need a certain type of person, right? Um, the kind of typical person who uh, is a talented software engineer but wants to make a big salary, you know, working at you know, Meta or working at Google or something like that, um, generally they're a little bit risk averse and they usually on a day-to-day -day basis, they might be willing to write all the glue that connects all of these primitives for Web3, but they're not really the type of person that's you know, gonna leave Meta and make no money for several years and work on a big ambitious project, you know, like a Web3 OS project, right? Um, and then you have someone who's not neurotypically wired, right? Somebody who's a big risk taker and somebody who might be willing to you know, sit at their computer for several years and not get paid. Um, but the problem with connecting primitives is you need lots of different people to do that, right? So then you need to find a collection of quite unusually uh, neurotypically wired people uh, to all sort of coordinate and work together. And if you look at the psychology research, these kind of big risk takers who don't necessarily you know, work at big companies for a salary and who don't look for stability, um, they actually have issues working with each other. Um, they're not the most agreeable people. So you need all of these unusual people who are very talented, very smart, um, to coordinate very tightly towards a common goal. But by nature, you know, on average, they're not the most agreeable people, right? So you've got, sort of got a social problem you need to overcome there as well. Um, so then, you know, the logical thing would be, you know, do you find a benevolent dictator to just fund all of these types of people, find them and build this, you know, for the long run, right? So. You know, will there be a question I pose here is, do we need something like an open AI for Web3, right? And I'm not even convinced yet that that's the right question or the right comparison to ask, but it's a big technical effort that needs to be overcome, I think, and a social one as well. Uh, the good news is there's some companies that are that have recognized this. Um, you know, I have no affiliation with any of these companies. This is not an endorsement. It's just ones that I'm aware of. Um, but I think these companies have recognized these same issues, right? So if you've heard of Urbit, um, they're trying to do this kind of OS idea for Web3 and connect all these prim primitives um, and interrupt as well. And you, some of you know probably know the name Tim Berners-Lee, and um, uh, he's the one kind of spearheading this interrupt project. So I'm sure there's others, but these are sort of the two big names in the space that are working on this. And you know, we might see Web3 um, you know, start to grow depending on how all these folks do, right? So again, not an endorsement. Um, there's some controversy surrounding both these companies. You can look that up for yourselves. Um, they're just ones that I know that exist in the environment. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, uh, yeah. uh, Andrew. There's a question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what is your opinion on privacy when it comes to public ledgers? Uh, what is my opinion on what? What is your opinion on privacy when it comes to public ledgers? Yeah. Um, that's a, it's a good question. It's a dual edged sword, right? Um, if, you know, anybody can audit the public ledger and see every single transaction that, um, that I made, um, that's not ideal, right? I might, you know, even if I'm not doing anything illegal, there are probably some things that I want to buy in the future that I don't want the entire world to be able to audit, right? But at the same time, it's that public auditing ability that allows for things like Bitcoin to exist. Um, so, but at the same time, I mean, if you use a private wallet and you're pretty good about, you know, making sure that you don't publicly broadcast your public key, um, if you really need to keep something private, um, you can. Um, and you know, you, then the question might ask, well, you need to put some money in that in that new wallet, and it's going to come from your old wallet. And if somebody, so there's all these things called, you know, uh, mixers that you can use to obfuscate that. Um, I don't think they're the most um, uh, they're the most uh, morally righteous things that are out there, the way that they're being currently used. But um, to give you a little bit of a round, roundabout answer, I don't have a strong opinion on the privacy trade-offs, but there's definitely trade-offs. Yeah. But there are the recent uh, work on JK rollups, which will give you privacy, avoid sharing information about uh, users. What do you think about them? Um, you don't know. Yeah, could you just repeat the first part again? Zero knowledge proofs. 
Yeah. So there are recent yeah. work on the zero, zero knowledge proofs. What do you think about that? Yeah, with with zero, zero knowledge proofs, um, without getting too much into the the technical sides of things, um, I um, there there's all, all all sorts of kind of uh, blockchain and uh, decentralization uh, methodologies that have been proposed uh, to improve blockchains in one way or the other. Um, I would say again, going back to the privacy issue, and I know that I'm running out of time. Um, there's always trade-offs in everything you do uh, with zero knowledge proofs and you know things like a multi-sig wallets as well. Um, you're starting to kind of lean some of those trade-offs in your favor. Um, so in general, I'm in favor of innovation in these regards um, to kind of ultimately kind of make these trade-offs work in your favor. But from what I've seen, um, everything that you implement in the blockchain, um, you're actually sacrificing somewhere else. Um, so no, I, at a very high level with kind of some of these fundamental technologies, that's been my observation. Um, but then again, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in every single methodology either, right? So uh, with, with proof of stake, for example, in layer two scaling, um, I don't know that as well as, as far as kind of coding, my coding abilities go as, you know, all the time that I spent on proof of work and securing that, right? But from my experience, there's kind of trade-offs everywhere you go. It's just what's good for your uh, kind of philosophy and your application. Makes sense. Thanks, yeah. Andrew. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll just end on this slide here. So this is kind of where we've ended as sort of our final uh, managerial application um, or managerial recommendation. Um, if you're looking at incorporating NFTs today, I think you just have to be resigned to the fact that if you're going to make trying to make money in the short term, you're probably going to have to make it using a collectible, right? And unfortunately, that's not the most exciting answer. But if you absolutely need to make money, money using NFTs, um, today it's going to be a collectible, right? Uh, longevity is still elusive. So, you know, while you're releasing this collectible, you know, try to find some utility somewhere. And we did a lot of kind of quantitative analysis looking at the blockchain and parsing it. And this model here shows you that, you know, as an NFT ages, and this goes for almost every single NFT that's out there, um, over time, there's a decline in transaction activity. These, this is what these minus, uh, these minus signs here indicate. Um, but there's things that you can use to slow down the decline in your transaction activity. So if you want your, your collectible to be traded as long as possible and stay in the public domain, um, turns out, surprisingly, social media activity doesn't really do much for you. So I think a lot of the um, kind of default state that people go under and into if they want to, you know, improve the popularity of their NFT after it's released is, oh, let's just, you know, market it substantial. Let's just market it like crazy, right? And turns out there's actually no effect on the difference between, or the, on the relationship between how old your collectible gets and how quickly it declines its transaction activity. Um, what does slow down that decline is trying to incentivize users somehow using money, right? So if you look at the looks rare um, uh, ex NFT exchange, for example, um, each time you transact on it, you get paid a little bit of their native cryptocurrency. And so it turns out that NFTs that are traded on looks rare uh, they seem to stay around a lot longer than NFTs that, you know, traditional NFTs on OpenSea or anywhere else. Um, so our general kind of recommendation we're sitting at now, and again, it might evolve in six months time, is that, you know, your NFT collectible is probably going to decline over time. Um, it's hard to reverse that. Your NFT is probably going to be a collectible, and that's okay if that's aligned with your business. Maybe you're a trading card company or something, right? Um, and the, the way you slow down that transaction activity is you need to incentivize your users somehow and um, surprisingly, you know, marketing it like crazy doesn't doesn't uh, really affect that decline. So I'll end here. Um, I apologize, my portion went a little bit over time, but um, I'm happy to kind of extend this discussion, um, answer questions. And if you have any follow up you want to contact me about, uh, feel free to use this contact info on this page. Thank you. Yeah, there's a couple of questions from the Zoom. <clears throat> uh, Jim oh, said. Yeah. Uh, let's say that I create an NFT marketplace. What regulations do I need to satisfy? Am I at significant legal risk? And what regulatory maintenance requires substantial funds on an ongoing basis? Also, would I incur other significant risks? Yeah, let's say, um, let, let, let's pick apart part that question a bit at a time. Um, could you repeat the first part of that question, Craig? Sure. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, and it's displayed on the Zoom uh, question oh, okay. and answer if you want to read it. Um, okay. Okay. Got so, it. Yeah, I found it from Jim App. Right. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so let's let's say that I create an NFT marketplace. Yeah. What regulations so, do I need to satisfy? Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, in the U.S., the U.S. SEC hasn't come out with uh, with um, actionable regulatory guidelines that you can follow and then be confident that you're not going to get the hammer laid down on you later on. So even a huge marketplace like Coinbase, um, they're actually getting regulatory scrutiny from the U.S. SEC. Um, so one safe way that you might want to do it is if you're really serious about starting a marketplace, um, I'm not sure if selling NFTs on it is the best way to go right from the get-go. Um, in, uh, in, in Canada, there's a difference in that um, the regulatory agencies here, um, I think this is a good thing, they're open to hearing from blockchain companies about what they want to do. And in some cases, the regulatory agency will work with the blockchain company to build, say, a marketplace or an NFT or a cryptocurrency um, to make sure that they stay compliant with that regulatory agency. Um, as far as I know, that that's, that's largely been unsuccessful in the U.S. If you reach out to the U.S. SEC, um, it's very un unlikely that you're going to get a response from them. Um, so I don't know what the best way to say to this other than the fact that if you're going to start some type of blockchain project and this is a concern, you might want to start it in a more friendly jurisdiction. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I was having a discussion with uh, one of my uh, master's students. He's from El Salvador. And a lot of uh, startup companies in the U.S. that are working on blockchain projects have relocated to El, El Salvador uh, because they have a very they have an environment that's very favorable and amenable um, to blockchain startups. Right. Um, so, you no. Know, to answer the question, am I at significant legal risk? Um, unfortunately, I think the answer is yes in the U.S. Um, and there's not very clear ways to mitigate that. And um, will regulatory maintenance require substantial funds on a continuing basis? Um, if you get regulatory scrutiny, yes, it will, because you're going to have to hire a lawyer to represent you, right, um, against the SEC, right? So, and the SEC can, uh, they can come and check on you as many times as they want, right? Um, and that's, you know, I'm not picking on the U.S. You know, I'm American myself, and um, I, I love America, right? But uh, it's just the reality of how uh, the blockchain environment is, uh, being regulated right now in the U.S., right? Um, also, would I incur other significant risks? Um, it depends on how you approach it, right? If you are taking a Sam Bankman fried uh, attitude towards the, the whole thing, then probably yes. But um, if you're kind, kind of genuinely trying to build a business that provides a lot of value, then obviously you can mitigate some of the external risks outside of regulation through that, right? Um, if an NFT consists of something that can be entirely displayed on a screen, how can it maintain any value in the face of piracy? Yeah, that's a, a good question, right? And the answer to that is the same way that, you know, I can print off a big poster of the Mona Lisa and put it on my wall, and it's not the same value as the actual Mona Lisa, right? And the actual owner of the actual Mona Lisa uh, can be verified on the blockchain. And that's sort of the... Um, that, that's sort of the, the MO of NFTs, right? Um, another question. Is there a critical lesson to be learned from early NFT experiment outcomes? Board Ape Yacht Club, yeah, questions regarding IP ownership. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And that, that's where our current recommendations lie. I think the critical lesson is you know, don't get swept up by the hype of NFTs. Um, don't build an NFT company for the sake of building it. Uh, build a really cool product first that users really enjoy using. And if NFTs happen to facilitate that, if NFTs happen to be a good fit, then by all means use an NFT, right? Um, but I think we need to remind ourselves, it seems obvious when we articulate it this way, but a lot of blockchain projects have forgotten this is you know, really create a business that has value to the user. And if NFTs are a good fit for it, then incorporate NFTs, but uh, don't build an NFT uh, company for the sake of no, because you really want to sell NFTs, right? Um, I think that's sort of the lesson. Uh, one question I had, it's broader about uh, blockchain and not just NFTs, but mm -hmm. I just, uh, it causes so much compute cost. Um, mm -hmm. I was reading and it, and it took about half a percent of the total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, 25 to 50 metric tons of CO2. 
Um, so that there's two sides of every coin. Are there people who are being conscientious and trying to contribute back to uh, planting trees, you know, offset carbon offset of one form or another? You know, I'm just curious about that. If right. uh, there's some people within that community of blockchain or NFTs that are a little bit more conscientious towards global warming. Yeah, so it's a big problem with uh, Bitcoin mining, and uh, Bitcoin uses uh, something called uh, proof of work, as I mentioned, where you need to, you know, check your check these hashes that you're you're guessing against the hash that you're trying to achieve, and it takes an insane amount of compute power, and it's extremely wasteful. There's no doubt about that, right? Um, so some of the solutions that are being proposed, Ethereum had a big one, and they've implemented proof of stake, which actually doesn't require. Uh, nearly as much compute power, right? Um, so if the kind of ecosystem puts enough pressure on Bitcoin, maybe the Bitcoin community will agree to migrate to proof of stake. Um, I don't see that happening anytime soon, but I would say that there are solutions that aren't as in energy in intensive. And the more kind of uh, problems and kind of uh, concerns that persist around how wasteful uh, Bitcoin mining is, uh, there's probably either going to be more Bitcoin competitors or Ethereum is going to just become way more popular because it's so uh, it's way less wasteful right but oddly enough with the rise of you know training these deep deep learning models right i mean that's extremely wasteful too like all the gpus that you need and all the compute power you need uh you know to train a sophisticated model like a big that, that's why it's so good like when they release a llama 2 open source then all of that base model training you don't have to do on hundreds of gpus uh for months that's just done once yes then it's yeah. released in open source then everybody can use it and then after that, you're doing prompt engineering, which is very light. You're doing um, uh, RAG lookup, which is as efficient as doing a database lookup and things like that. So yeah. to the extent things are released to the open source, um, then that can reduce a lot of duplicate computation. But yeah. I think with blockchain, every computation has to be yeah. redone to yeah. add a block. Uh, yeah. I, and, and help me understand... You know, in that, what was a chain of stake, would that reduce computation by 10%, 50%, 90%? I, I don't have much of a concept. Yeah, so, so proof of stake would be, you know, without, know, without knowing the exact numbers of which blockchain you're using, and you'd have to look at kind of network times as well. Um, the actual energy usage would be fractions and fractions of 1%. So it, it nearly eliminates. It would problem. reduce it by fractions of 1% or go down oh, to no, it, it would reduce fractions by, of 1%. By over, it would reduce it by nine, the energy usage by over 99%. Oh, that would be awesome. Okay, that's huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's still I, network fees with proof of stake, but um, the actual energy output is, the, the problem's almost solved with that, yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, Andrew, to follow in question to the same one when you were talking about Bitcoin. So yeah. most of these NFTs are centered on standard ECR 721 and Ethereum. Yeah. Is there any work being uh, produced NFTs on blockchain like Bitcoin networks or Lightning network or side chains? Is any work being done on that area? Yep, absolutely. There's uh, lots of NFTs on different types of blockchains. Um, the ER our ERC721, um, as you mentioned, are still by far the most popular one. Um, actually, Bitcoin had these things called colored coins, uh, colored coins way back in the day, um, where kind of in the uh, in each um, in each transaction there is a notes field where you could type something in, and technically that would differentiate each Bitcoin. Um, so you might call that the first NFT, on, but it just never really took off on uh, the Bitcoin network. Um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's kind of lots of different NFTs on uh, different blockchains. It's just the Ethereum ones so dominant right now. Got it. And is there any cross-platform compatibility currently you see from one chain to another chain, a chain like Polkadot or else we have Cosmos? Yeah. And, you know, so what do you see that ecosystem coming towards? Yeah. They're working together to transfer this NFT, which is minted Excellent. on Ethereum, moving to another uh, cross-chain? Yeah. So now we're talking about blockchain interoperability, right? Yeah. And um, in general, I'm excited about it, but the criticism against these things is, well, I mean, who runs the who, who, who runs the new chain that kind of merges the two chains, right? Who runs Cosmos? Who runs Polkadot, right? So then you have this uh, centralization issue there again. Um, and then, so do you have a separate community that makes these things interoperable? But um, I think they, these, they have to be interoperable at some point, right? If we don't want one single dominant blockchain 
and we want to have the flexibility to use lots of these different ones, but we want to sell one NFT and put it on a different one. Like we do need these, this type of interoperability like Cosmos and Polkadot. Um, it's just every time, that's one of the things that's funny about the blockchain market is there's so many people that are deeply married to their philosophical ideas around it that anytime anything, anyone tries something new, um, you know, the wolves start coming at them, right? Um, but yeah, there's, there's like I was talking about with the trade-offs before, there's always going to be uh, trade-offs with everything you do, but that doesn't mean we should stop trying, right? Got it. And most of these chains currently compatible with block uh, Ethereum, EVM, I see there is Avalanche and uh, Polkadot Cosmos providing this uh, yeah. option if you want to transfer from one chain to another chain. I, I haven't followed much on NFT side. Yeah, absolutely. So so Polkadot was like the big, big yeah. popular one that, that came about first. And um, I think where the market's kind of migrating right now, it's just my personal observation is that, you know, most people who are, who are very interested in NFTs, they try to stay as close to Ethereum as possible. Um, but, you know, there's, there's always your people that are going to be interested in, you know, keeping things on you know, your polygons and uh, using kind of, you know, taking advantage of interoperability and all of these marketplaces, they need to make sure that they're interoperable too, right? If you want to, if you're a marketplace and you want to sell lots of NFTs, right, you can't burden the user of saying, okay, well, this is only going to work on this particular blockchain and this one works on another. So all, all of these marketplaces, like they need to make sure that they're interoperable too. Makes sense. Thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, the last audience question, uh, Jim, asking how high are the transaction costs? Yeah, it depends on uh, the state of the network. So if you're trying to send you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum or an NFT when there's a lot of activity that's happening, um, it's going to be very expensive, like potentially hundreds of dollars worth of the native currency. Uh, if you're doing it at off-peak hours, you know, I, 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 sometimes they're quite cheap. Like um, I haven't really transacted lately without at least paying a couple bucks right, in transaction fees, um, but it's not prohibitively expensive. But um, if you're doing it during you know peak network times, it's going to be very expensive. Right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've answered all of our questions. Um, just to wrap up, uh, are there any announcements for MyTriple E upcoming events you want to mention or anything else? Um Thanks, Greg. Uh, currently, we are working on upcoming events for next year, early next year. If anyone interested to participate or else, uh, if, if you have any suggestion for new speakers, we're happy to take up. And we have social media handlers. Please do follow us. We will keep posted there. Okay, excellent. Um, and then for ACM, look at our meetup site for SF Bay ACM. We have uh, a, uh, I'll be posting some of the meetups uh, for the first week of January and also on into, uh, I'm sorry, the first week of December, and then also uh, later in January. We've got a, a number of events coming up. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. And thank you very much, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It was Thanks nice. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.